So if you have your bulletins or your uh, phone, you can pull it out and I'll uh, highlight a few of the announcements we want to make sure that we, we're all on the same page about. Um, if you have your connection card, whether it's um, online or if you have a little paper one that's in the back of your, uh, your chair right there, you can fill it out. If you have a prayer request, something you want us to go to the Lord for for you, if it's a praise as well, whatever it is, we want to be praying for each other, and you can drop those in the giving boxes in the back or out in the foyer. Um, if you have questions about an event coming up, you can fill one of those out as well or say, hey, tell me about what's happening here or I want to help out in this area because I'm excited about it. All those type of things. Um, the connection card's a great way just to get that ball rolling or you can just do the old school call up the church office if that works for you too. Um, really cool event coming up. Marriage Matters Preparing Rich Retreat. It's a two-day event. So if you're engaged or you've been married for 70 years, um, Scott and uh, his team of facilitators that have all been trained, I'll be doing a workshop those two days. That is May 18th and 19th. So it's a little ways out still, but not too far. It's coming up quick, right? Especially when the weather's like this. Um, it's a, a good time for you as a couple to have a refresher, even to, to look at your marriage and say, hey, are there things that we're not communicating well about or things we need to connect on a little better. It's just a, a, a great resource. There's an assessment that goes with that, uh, the Prepare Rich assessment. And so um, the entire event itself, the two days, the training and the assessment, it's 60 bucks for a couple. And that includes, like I said, all the workshop, workbook stuff and dinner, dessert, breakfast. Um, Scott will probably do some dancing, interpretive dance or something like that along the way. It's always really, really Horrible to watch. So, be a great time. If you have questions, I'd tell you to ask Pastor Scott, but him and a few of the other guys are down at the Shepherds Conference and they're making their way back today. So, um, you can fill out on the connection card you're interested. Uh, there is one caveat with that. If you want to be a part of the group, there's that assessment you have to complete by May 14th, so a few days before the training itself. So, be sure to sign up and get that done. If you would like to be a part of that. Again, if you have more questions, fill out the connection card or talk to one of the ladies in the back. FPU, Financial Peace University, Mike and Connie Redmond. Mike's down over here. I don't know where Connie's in the back, probably running around somewhere. Do an amazing job facilitating our FPU. Mike, would you put your hand up so we can see? Look at that. You can accost Mike. He's right up here if you have questions. Um, but they faithfully and consistently run that course every year, sometimes a couple times a year, and it is a great way to say, hey, I need to get a little more handle on my finances and be responsible with what I've been called to be a steward of, and so if you want to ask questions, you can speak to Mike, but the, the class that they're going to be running is April 8th, um, and it runs through June 3rd, and meets on Sunday afternoons right here from 3 to 5. There is child care if you would like child care for that. Um, it's 100 bucks for the class. And if you need some help with that at all, you can talk to Mike and Connie about uh, potentially scholarships that are available. But a great way is the Lord's entrusted us with resources just to be good stewards of that. So talk to Mike and Connie. Um, game night is just around the corner, the 17th. Right here, actually down in the, um, the children's ministry wing from 4 to 9 p.m. Bring a snack, bring some games. If you don't play games and you just want to hang out and talk, that's me usually. Uh, come to that time. It's, it's a great time of fellowship and fun and, and beating somebody if you like to play games. So make sure you check that out. He's risen. He risen indeed. It's true. And we're going to get to we'll remind each other about that quite a bit here in the next few weeks. Because Easter is around the corner and Jesus' life, death burial, but especially as resurrection is something we're going to celebrate together. April 1st is uh, Resurrection Sunday. We'll be here on Sunday morning, so invite your friends, family. Um, if there's someone that you've just been wanting to reach out to, invite them to come. What a great time for them to hear the message of the, the truth of how everlasting life is to be had. So 10 a.m. gathering here. If you think that the fireside room might be a better or more comfortable setting, you can sit in there. 
If you're one of those early risers and you want to be part of the sunrise service at 6 a.m. over at the high school stadium, make sure you bring a blanket or a heater. Some of you guys bring those propane heater things, and you'll have lots of friends if you do that. Um, but that is a great time uh, at 6 a.m. over at the high school stadium. Excited about it. All right, we are in the book of Matthew. We're continuing to talk um, about what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, hearing from the king directly, and obviously there's lots of voices in our world telling us how we ought to live and what we ought to think, but we want to hear what Jesus says. So for a number of weeks now, we've been listening as Jesus explains a statement that he said that was quite shocking then and even now. It was, goes back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, read the rest with me, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. People heard that and says, whoa, I don't have a chance then. Because they all knew that the external righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees was right at the top. And there's never any way that they could reach that. So Jesus then is explaining that he's not talking about the external. He's not talking about an external display of righteousness. He's talking about surpassing the scribes and Pharisees by a righteousness that comes from the heart, from a transformed heart. He's not talking about keeping the letter of the law better, but understanding the spirit of the law and the heart of God even behind it. So the religious leaders of the day said, don't murder. But they didn't talk about anger in the heart. The religious leaders of the day said, don't commit adultery. But they didn't talk about lust in the heart. The religious leaders of the day taught about all the technicalities of divorce, but they didn't talk about the heart of God in marriage and what he intended. So we've seen this pattern. You've heard what they've said. Now let me get deeper. Let me go to the heart with you. And I want to remind you as well, that Jesus is not contrasting his teaching with the Old Testament. He's contrasting his teaching with what the religious leaders of the day said about the Old Testament. It's an important thing to know. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. You've been so good that you've had written down what you want us to know. You've been so good because you've given us the Holy Spirit that we can actually not just understand it, but see it applied in our lives. So we're asking today, again, as we gather here, that you would make your word clear to each one of us in the way that we need to understand it for the things that you're doing in our lives today. So open our ears transform our hearts. Amen. So we continue today in verse 33. Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, or that what they said, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no, worth, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is a footstool of the his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond this, anything beyond these is of evil. So what's Jesus referring back to in Usually when I put it on the screen, I put the Old Testament passage that he's from her back to in caps. That just helps me. 
But Jesus is not quoting directly one passage from the Old Testament. He's taking a number of passages. Let me just show you these from Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that make the point. This is what was said in the Old Testament. Don't swear falsely. If you make a vow to the Lord, keep it. Don't delay to pay it. And they're very straightforward commandments to the people of God in the Old Testament. And one could ask, what was God aiming at when he gave these very clear commands? And at the sake of stating the obvious, or the risk of stating the obvious, I've learned that sometimes if I don't state the obvious, it is missed. Here's what he's saying. Here's what's behind this. God wanted his people to tell the truth and keep their promises. Stated negatively, God wanted his people to not lie and to not break their promises. Why did he want that for them? This is something, please don't miss. Why did he want them to keep their promises? Why did he want them to tell the truth? See, God gives that law, along with all the other laws, for very good reason. He gives laws so that people would understand who he is, what he's like, and then so that that could be a reflection and even displayed to the world, particularly his Old Testament people. He tells them often, I want you to let the world know who I am and what I'm like, and I've given you these laws to help towards that. But also, in a much more practical way, he gave them these laws so that as they obeyed them, there'd be blessing. That it would be actually better for them. Not problem-free, but it would be better for them if they did these things. So understand this, church. God's laws were always, without exception, for the good of the people so that God could bless them as they obeyed. God's laws were always and without exception for his glory so that he could be made known through them as they were lived out. Now it appears for the Old Testament people of God, they had forgotten that. And I dare say that sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we miss that. We forget that everything that we read in God's word, if it's in the form of a command, is for our good and for his glory. Do you believe that? If we don't believe that, then we really struggle with living any of this out. So then back to this passage we're looking at, tell the truth, keep your promises. So this is kind of like a no-brainer. Things are better for me when I tell the truth and I keep my promises. My wife appreciates that. When I work with people in the community, it actually goes much better if I tell the truth and keep my promises. In the church, things are really good when we tell the truth and keep our promises. So you understand, it's just good for us if we do this, right? It was Mark Twain who said, if you tell the truth, you don't have to have a good memory. Yeah, you don't have to t remember who you told the lie to and what lie you told. You just tell the truth. That's always the goal. Now understand as well, when we tell the truth, when we keep our promises, we shine the light on the very character of God because the very character of God is truth. At the very heart of God is a God who loves to make covenants and then fulfill them. There's a passage in the Old Testament that comes to us through a real strange guy named Balaam. He says this, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. 
Does he speak and then not act? The answer is no. Does he promise and not fulfill? No. I've received a command to bless, and he is blessed, and I cannot change it. In other words, God's intention is to do this, and he said he would, and he will. So what was going on in the religious system of Jesus' day that he would even need to go to this very obvious truth? Here's what was going on. The religious leaders of the day were doing two things. First of all, they were making frivolous, meaningless promises or oaths about things that really didn't matter. And they were doing that so they would look good and look holy and and look even righteous. And then they were also creating loopholes in these verbal promises so that things that they really didn't want to do, they didn't have to by the way that they worded them. So for these religious leaders, the only oath or promise that they were bound to was one that they made in the name of God. So then they would make a promise in the name of the earth. Or an oath on Jerusalem, or an oath based on heaven, or an oath by their head. They would make oaths that would, by using the proper language, they could actually get out of. So that's why Jesus says, don't make an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by the earth, it's the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, it's the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Jesus says, the earth is God's and Jerusalem is his city, so there's no loophole. Every oath you make, every promise you make is actually before God and it needs to be kept. You can't frame it in a way that it's just something you can step out of. Don't take his words to mean that God is against making vows or promises. Actually, he delights to do that. And he always fulfills his promises. What those words tell us is we shouldn't make trivial promises for show. And we shouldn't somehow frame our promises in a way that we can just skirt by them. Well, I didn't really mean it. So that's why he goes on to kind of end this section by saying, let your yes be yes. It's no. That means no. You don't need to make a promise. It's interesting. The Apostle James actually says the same thing in James 5, 12. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and let your no be no that's enough. Because yes should be a promise. Amen? You see what he's saying? No should be a promise. You don't need to somehow form this in a way that makes you look really good. And you certainly shouldn't make loopholes that you can get out of your yes or your no. Now what's interesting is even this points ultimately to Jesus. The Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church and he's talking to them about his support of them and even in that context, notice what the Apostle Paul writes. He says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are, say it, yes in Christ. All the promises are fulfilled by Jesus. And so through him they the um, amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. What does amen mean? Yeah, it doesn't mean the end. <laughs> it doesn't mean, okay, I'm done now. Amen means, so be it. May it be. So that's why we say at the end of our prayers, amen, Lord, may it be, and may you bring it about. I remember playing with my brother and cousins and we'd be wrestling around and somebody would get hurt and we would say, okay, I promise not to do it again. 
I promise I won't do it again. Oh, but I had my fingers crossed behind my back. And then you do it again. It's that sort of thing. You make a promise, but you really never intend to keep the promise. And then you remember that phrase, cross my heart and hope and to, to die. How does it end? Stick a needle in my eye. You ever research that? That actually goes back to the 1900s, early 1900s. It was a long, part of a long religious poem, and the crossing your heart is a whole religious thing. It was a religious thing. And it was a way of saying, oh, I'm going to do this, or I'll stick a needle in my eye. What a graphic, <laughs> very graphic way of making a promise. And, and all that to say, that shouldn't be necessary if I tell you yes, that means I'll do it. If I tell you no, that means I won't do it. So just by way of application to wrap up this little section, are you and I known as people who tell the truth? Can you be trusted? When we say we will do something, do we do it? Understand why that's so critical. Because when God says he will do something, he does it. And we display the very character of God, the very heart of God, by completing our promises, by speaking the truth. God's not looking for a loophole that he can get out of anything, nor should we. We tell the world what God is like when by his grace we tell the truth and keep our promises. Jesus then moves on to a section that is widely known but greatly misunderstood. Going to verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. And if anybody wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. So understand, to understand Jesus' words here, we need to really understand this eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's actually a short section, the first two phrases of a longer section that's repeated three times in the Old Testament. It's in Exodus 21, Leviticus 24, and Deuteronomy 19. Now, we could take the time and go to those passages and look at each one of them. Here's what we would see if we would dig into those. We would see this, that those passages in the Old Testament this principle, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, was directed to the judges of the day, the leaders of the people of God who were tasked with the responsibility of rendering a verdict on things that were brought to them. The second thing we would notice is that this principle was given to these judges to limit excessive judgments. We would say it this way. The punishment must fit the crime, but not beyond. It was given so that the judges of that day in rendering decisions on behalf of the people would not go too far, wouldn't exceed what would be appropriate. To say it another way, God gave this principle to the judges of his people so that proper judgment would be given and that sinful tendency within the human heart, even of those judges, for revenge or retaliation would be checked and tempered. That was God's intent in giving this principle, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So what God was telling the people back then sounded like this more accurately. Only an eye for an eye. 
only a tooth for a tooth. Don't go beyond, don't be excessive. So what were the religious leaders of Jesus' day saying or not saying about this principle? Well, to just lay it out there, they weren't saying what I just said to you. They weren't giving the background of this. They weren't helping the people understand who it was given to and why it was given. And I believe that that was an intentional oversight. So that even these religious leaders could take this principle and bring it down to them at a personal level, not a judicial level, as a personal level. And it began to be used for just the opposite of what God intended. It began then on a personal level to be a license for personal vengeance or revenge. Understand, the religious leaders of the day had warped this by taking it out of context, removing it from the judicial system and bringing it down to personal relationships. So if somebody steals from you, go steal from them. If somebody hits you, then you hit them. That wasn't the intent of this at all, ever from the heart of God. Again, they separated from the courts, brought it down to personal relationships, and in essence, they created another loophole to do what they wanted to do. So Jesus then, in explaining this, he's basically saying, leave this principle here at the court level. Now let me tell you how to relate one another because you have a higher principle. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, that relates to the judicial system, in your personal relationships, I'm going to call you to something even higher than that. And that's when he says this in verse 39. I say to you, I say to you personally, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now there's a lot we need to unpack here because this is not about getting hit in the face. Notice specifically, he says, being slapped on the right cheek. There are significant cultural issues being displayed here. I want to take you all the way back to the Old Testament. We see it there as well. Prophet Jeremiah speaks about this. Notice this. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. It's talking about this uh, humiliation that comes upon him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Verse 30, let him give his cheek to the one who strikes and let him be filled with what? Insult. Those are critical words there. The cheek, the striking, the insulting. Again, what Jesus is talking to the people about is not getting slugged in the face by somebody. This isn't a physical thing he's talking about. He's talking about being insulted. He's talking about people being degraded or humiliated by someone. So, if I'm going to hit somebody in the face with my fist and I'm right-handed and most people are right-handed, I'm going to hit them normally on what jaw or what cheek? Anybody? The left. Brent, do you want to help me demonstrate this? No. All right. We probably, I don't need to physically act this out for you. But I'm hitting somebody with my right hand. I'm hitting them on the left cheek. So if I'm going to hit them on the right cheek, it's going to require, unless I'm really dexterous, a backhanded slap. Now that's significant in that culture. That's not being hit in the face. That means you've just been insulted. It was humiliation to the highest degree. It was a display, it was me displaying to this person that you're not even worthy of me hitting you. I'm going to backhand you because you're just an inferior See, to have a fight with somebody is to be an equal. To backhand somebody is to say 
you're inferior. The Jews said that the most demeaning, contemptuous, arrogant act of a man is to slap you with the back of his hand. And I have a quote here from a slave who actually later in the culture became a great philosopher. That's kind of interesting. And he writes this. He says, A slave would rather be thrashed with a whip than slapped with the back of his master's hand. Because that was humiliating, that was insulting, that was degrading, that was belittling. Now, I've never been backhanded by anyone. But I have been demeaned by people. I have been ridiculed by people. I have been made little of by people. Anybody else? What's your first response to that? When that happens to you, when that happens to me, when it's face to face, my first response is to respond in kind. No, not in kind, even a little bit more. My natural response is to defend my dignity by verbally assaulting them. Each assault and each insult more degrading than the first. That's my initial response. I dare say that's your first initial response. Well, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, no, don't resist an evil person who insults you. Turn to him the other cheek. So what's he saying to do? then don't retaliate. Don't attack him verbally. But he's saying, but don't run away from it either because to turn the other cheek is to say, no, I'm an equal and I'll stand and I'll take this and I'll face it. I'll be strong enough in the midst of this not to run, but also strong enough not to retaliate But I'll stand, and I'll meet you face to face. There's a key principle here, church. Offense exists not in the insult, but in our reaction to it. Let me say it again. The offense exists not in the insult, but in our reaction to it. What am I saying? That just because somebody says something humiliating to me doesn't mean I'm humiliated. Just because somebody says something offensive to me doesn't mean I'm offended. Just because somebody says something degrading to me doesn't mean I'm degraded. Just because somebody says something belittling to me, it doesn't mean I'm belittled. The offense exists not in the insult that comes, but on our response to it. We don't insult back. We stand. We absorb it. And I would say to those of us who are followers of Jesus, we can do that because we know our identity. Amen? We know who we are. That is secured, and what anybody says about us doesn't change that at all. So Jesus, again, continues. He gives another example of, in personal relationship, here's the principle. If anybody wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Now, again, there's some cultural things going on here. Jesus is most likely referring to the Old Testament and the Old Testament law. It mentions shirts and coats or tunics and cloaks. And in Exodus chapter 22, it says, if somebody, uh, if you owe somebody something and they want some security that you're going to repay them, they can take your coat, but they need to return it at night because in that culture, if you don't have your coat or your cloak, your outer garment, 
then you're actually exposed to the elements. That's really all they had to cover themselves with. So God tells his people in the Old Testament, they can take your coat for a security or a pledge, but they need to give it back at night. But Jesus says what? Give them your coat. Give them more than they could even should ask for. Give them your shirt and your coat. Again, here's the high standard. Jesus is telling his followers, if you owe somebody something and they, they want some sort of collateral or security, then give them what they wanted even more so, just to prove that, yes, you will fulfill this. They want your shirt as security? Give them your coat as well. Do everything that you can and even beyond to make sure that this is resolved you're doing everything you can. Now, I don't want to spend a long time on this one. I just want to remind you that what, something earlier that Jesus said in this sermon, he said, blessed are the peacemakers, right? I want to remind you what the Apostle Paul says. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. In other words, go as far as you possibly can to make sure this is right in your relationship and then the writer of Hebrews says, pursue peace with all men. That's the expectation for the follower of Jesus in personal relationships. You go a little bit further in making sure that this is resolved. So it makes us ask a few questions. So in my personal relationships, am I more interested in revenge or in making peace? <clears throat> are we more interested in securing our legal rights or displaying Christ's righteousness? Jesus gives another example. Verse 41. Whoever fo forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Now remember, the people who first heard those words were under Roman occupation. There were Roman soldiers everywhere. Another thing that in that context, it's important to know that it was the Romans, as they conquered their empire, they put roads everywhere. And when Kim and I were over in Israel, it was interesting, the, the bus pulled over one place and there was this stone sitting in the ground. And I said, well, that's an interesting looking stone. What is it? There's a picture of one there. It was a Roman milestone. So as the Romans conquered their empire, when they would walk a thousand paces, they would drive a stake, and later they would put a stone in the ground and say, that's a mile, that's a mile. So everywhere across the land, there are these mile markers. Another thing we need to understand culturally it was Roman law that as they conquered areas of the land that a Roman soldier could grab anybody he wanted to to carry his gear, his backpack, or whatever it is he had to carry from one place to another, but he could only have them carry it, how far? Just a mile. That gives us a little context of why Simon of Cyrene, when Jesus could no longer carry his cross, the Roman soldier just grabbed somebody and said, what? You carry his cross. And he was obligated to do it because it was Roman law. Now I'm supposing that nobody really enjoyed being stopped by a Roman soldier in the midst of their day saying, okay, you need to carry my stuff for a mile. That would kind of disrupt your day, wouldn't it? And I'm so also supposing that the average person who was asked of that, they would go their mile and then they would drop the pack and just walk away, knowing that's all they were obligated to do. But imagine for a moment the response from a Roman soldier when a Christian is carrying his gear. And he comes to the end of the required mile. And he turns to the soldier and he says, I'll carry another one if you like. That Roman soldier's thinking, whoa, this is a little different. And maybe in the steps of that second mile, there's some conversation or maybe some questions about, 
Why would this guy do that? I'm thinking that Roman soldier would respond the same way our boss would respond when the boss asks you to do something that nobody ever wants to do. You know, nobody in the office, everybody in the office avoids that job. Everybody on the crew says, well, somebody else will do it. Do you have some of those sort of jobs at your place? But when you're asked to do it and you say, I'd be glad to do that. Is there anything else like that you want me to do? It's a shocking sort of thing to be done. So to go the extra mile, it's something you do not because you have to, church, but because you can. Because of the eternal impact that is made in that extra mile. Please understand the first mile is required and there's no blessing in doing what is required the second mile is extra, and that's where the blessing is. And that's where the impact is. So let's make this practical. Children. Are there any children in here? There's a few right down here. How about that second mile at home where, you know, you have some chores to do, and you do those, but then you go to mom and dad and say, hey, can I do some more just to be helpful? That is crazy talk, isn't it? But that's exactly what Jesus is talking about. Doing the required, but then saying, I'll do a little bit more because I can. I know I don't have to, but I can. Husbands. Gosh, I hate this part. <laughs> what about going that second mile with your wife? And you do a little bit more than just pick up your dirty underwear and socks. You actually went a little bit further and say, here's some things I can do that will bless her and encourage her. Well, not because you have to, but because you can. Because there's a blessing for her and you. And so church, what if our community knew we were the ones that went above and beyond all the time? In anything that we did in the community, we do a little bit more. Not because we have to, but because we can. What if we're the ones that didn't just pay our taxes, because I think that's required, right? But we went a little bit further and say, no, we'll actually do some things to make this place we live more of a blessing to other people. The blessing is found in the second mile. The eternal reward is at the end of the second mile. Everybody has to go the first mile. But who's going to go the second? That's what Jesus is saying. Who's going to go a little bit further in relationship? So then Jesus makes one last point. Verse 42, give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You ever notice how much we like our stuff? Maybe it's just me, but I like my stuff. That's why I bought my stuff, because I like my stuff. I'm not sure I want you touching any of my stuff. Why? Because I like my stuff. You may break my stuff. You may not return my stuff. Am I, am I the only one that feels that way about my stuff? So the problem in my thinking is I actually think it's my stuff. So that's problem number one because everything is God's and I've just been blessed with stuff. I heard a quote or read a quote from John Wesley who said this, the Lord's house burned. One less responsibility for me. Now that's an interesting way to think about it. God's house, it's God's stuff, and if it goes away, then I actually have less to encumber my life. So I want to meddle just a little bit. What do you own right now that you would never let anybody borrow? You're probably naming them all right now, aren't you? 
What do you own right now that you actually don't want anybody to know that you have because somebody might want to borrow it? So I have some of those things, and when I recognize that, I realize I actually don't possess them. They possess me because I'm guarding them. Again, we probably don't need to flesh this out. I think you get the point. Jesus says if somebody wants to borrow something you have, then you give it to them because really it's not really yours and it could be a blessing to them. And if it doesn't come back, you know what doesn't, wasn't yours anyway. Now I want you to notice that in all of these illustrations, Jesus puts the emphasis on the relationship on our relationship with a person, not our rights in the relationship. I want you to notice in all of these illustrations, Jesus puts the emphasis on the person and not the object or the stuff. Jesus in all of these things is saying, look beyond your rights. Look beyond your protection. Look beyond your dignity. Look at the people that you're interacting with and recognize the eternal impact you can have if you live by these higher principles. Jesus is saying, look beyond your shriveled world of your stuff, your rights, and your dignity. And look beyond, my, look beyond that world to my kingdom because he would say to us, you know what? My kingdom's not based on your stuff. My kingdom, he says, is not based on your rights. My kingdom is not based on you being protected. My kingdom is all about my glory. And when you live by these higher principles and personal relationship, then I get all the glory. I'm made known. My character is displayed in these relationships. Anybody know who David Livingston was? Great English missionary to Africa. Literally, his heart was taken out of his body when he died and was buried in Africa because of his heart to see the people reached with the gospel. He literally gave up everything to go to Africa and die for the sake of the gospel. I found something he said, challenged me. He says, I place no value on anything I have or may possess except in relation to the kingdom of God. If anything will advance the interests of the kingdom, it shall be given away or kept. Only as by giving or keeping it shall most promote the glory of him to whom I owe all my hopes in time or eternity. Boy, Lord, get me to that place. Amen? To say that everything that I have is of no value except that I can give it away for the kingdom of God or use it somehow for the kingdom of God. Otherwise, he's saying it's really kind of pointless. Lord, bring us to that point. So as we wrap this up, isn't it amazing how God's word remains relevant in every culture. Yeah, so there's no Roman soldiers around making us walk a mile, but all of us this week will have some second miles we can walk, won't we? Completely different situation. Completely different people expecting things of us that we can say, no, I'll go a little bit further. I'll go a little bit further in my marriage. I'll go a little bit further at the job. I'll go a little bit further in the community. I'll go a little bit further in the church. It's interesting, there are new digital ways now that we can get backhanded and insulted, right? And it's really easy to, to get on the phone or on the laptop and strike back verbally, but Jesus says, no, don't engage that. Don't, don't assault them the way you've been assaulted, but Stand into that. Stand up to that. And of course, church, I remind you that none of this is even remotely possible unless we understand that Jesus did this very thing. 
He faced the humiliation. He went the extra mile. This was his life. And as his life becomes more and more a part of our life, then these things can be possible. So I always want to be quick to bring it back to Jesus. This isn't this to-do list now, church. <laughs> it's not the to-do list. You just got to go out and work harder at this. It's, it's the challenge to see Jesus, how he lived and how he lives his life out even through us today. May God make it so. Father, we thank you again for the challenge of your word. And we confess, Lord, I confess, this is way too much for me. I have way too much stuff. I'm way too concerned about my reputation. Lord, I'm way too concerned about my rights. So, Jesus, I pray that even as we sing, you would resonate in us your truth in a way that it's taking root and being lived out. Because, Jesus, we know it's good for us. And because, Jesus, we know that ultimately it makes you known to the people around us. So we just ask for help by your Holy Spirit.